Welcome to Africa 360, where we scour the continent for news and views with a distinctly African perspective. I'm Chris Marleng, inviting you to see Africa like you've never seen it before. This week on Africa 360, the votes have been counted and ZANU-PF, the party in power since Zimbabwe's independence, emerged victorious once again, winning more than two-thirds majority in parliament and a comfortable 61%. In short, that President Robert Mugabe would be sworn in as the leader of Zimbabwe for a seventh time. In the last of our four-part special on the Zimbabwean elections, we look at the events that unfolded and ask, where to now for Zimbabwe? Well, Africa 360 has dedicated much time and resources to the story that is Zimbabwe's general election. Not only because of our valued viewer in that country, but because it is a country that plays such a key role in the Southern African region. But it is also a very polarizing story as we have gathered during the course of our in-depth coverage. While we are dedicated to objectivity and accuracy, we have received criticism and indeed praise from every side. The challenge has been how to arrive at a balance from what we've heard from our valued viewers. In the four episodes though, that we dedicated to exploring the Zimbabwean situation, we have invited all parties to the table. In some instances, we were welcomed, in others, simply shunned. It's difficult to remain passive, as you can imagine, acting as simply an observer, watching what could develop into a political, economic, and regional crisis. As we reported on the elections, we could not ignore the accusations of a stolen vote. Equally, we recorded the celebrations of yet another win for ZANU-PF. However, we remain seized with the issue of Zimbabwe, not for the sake of sensation, not at all, but rather for the importance of the story for the continent. Journalists often have the advantage of being on the front line of history, and Zimbabwe's so-called harmonized election was no different. While ordinary Zimbabweans are sometimes hesitant to speak out, we have with us today the journalists who had the privilege of speaking to politicians and citizens and recording the events as they unfolded. Well, joining me in our studio today is ENC, ENCA Group News Editor, Ben Said, who reported from Mulai and Harare, and ENCA's own senior producer, Dumaule Mutlaudi, who covered Harare and nearby Chinoy, and Susan Njanji, a Zimbabwean national, who covered the elections for international press agency, Agence France Press. Welcome all to our discussion. Uh, you've been feeling a little bit tired, I'm sure, Ben, after uh, those weeks of reporting on Zimbabwe. That's right, Chris. Uh, thanks for asking me to come on. Yeah. Um, but it was a great privilege to be in Zimbabwe. Mm. And, and, and w were you surprised by the eventual outcome? I think I was surprised by the margin of it, as was the MDC. Um, I wasn't surprised with the result per se, yeah. but I didn't think uh, President Robert Mugabe uh, would win by as much as he did. I didn't think ZANU-PF would do as much as, uh, as well as they did in Parliament as well. And then your experience uh, being in Bulawayo, it's, it's known as the hotbed of opposition support. But what we saw from uh, the statistics coming out, particularly from the parliamentary result, is that there seemed to have been an inversion in uh, that characteristic. Yeah, in a sense there was. Of course, uh, ZANU-PF didn't... Uh, win any wards in the local uh, government elections there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they did do in all the different elections in Bulawayo and the surrounding areas was improve their proportion of the vote, whether it was for President Robert Mugabe, for their local National Assembly candidates, or for local ward councillors. So mm -hmm. uh, that was a bit of, su of a surprise. And yeah. one MDC person that I spoke to said to me, and credulously on the, on the night of the results, mm -hmm. 
President Robert Mugabe got 25% in my ward, mm. that's, that, that, that's just simply never happened. <laughs> so, you know, that was the first indication uh, for some that there'd been some skullduggery here. So skullduggery then, and, and that is what I want to look at, uh, Susan. Uh, th there have been these allegations emerging about irregularities, uh, going as far as claiming that the vote was fixed, it was rigged in favor of ZANU-PF and President Robert Mugabe. What's your view on that? I think like what we saw from the reports of the um, observers that were there, um, certainly there were indications that there were some people who were not able to cast their ballots, people who were turned away, uh, underage voters who found their ways into polling stations, people who were bust in. Um, I think there is a feeling that the election itself wasn't exactly fair. Yeah, it was free because there was no violence, right? People were able to go and vote, but some things were just not in order. Now, now, now Tommy, you, you, you were in, in Zimbabwe also reporting, you've covered a number of other elections here in South Africa and further afield. How, how did you feel like as a journalist? Were you able to uh, do your work unfettered? Did you feel safe at all times? Yeah, this, this certainly was uh, the outcome out in, in Chinoy. I didn't know what to expect heading out uh, there, to be honest. Uh, I think uh, from previous experience, we didn't even make it past uh, Bytebridge uh, in the previous elections. We didn't, we didn't get through. And uh, of course, Ben here will tell you that uh, I had to send an SOS because uh, I was detained. But um, out in, in Chinoy, it, it, the mood was free. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were no incidents, certainly in the time that I was there. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, ZDC officials and observers were on hand to try and and show you what is happening. Uh, you've got when we got to polling stations, you know, they'd ask questions. Uh, is there anything you want to see? Be free, film. Mm -hmm. And even with the locals around, uh, they were just re really open. Uh, there was no menacing presence, uh, certainly that I could see of mm -hmm. of any state officials or police. So it, it was certainly free. Uh, the atmosphere while I was there. It's interesting. Now, uh, g given your sense about uh, the freeness of the elections and and the freeness that you enjoyed to observe these elections. What then would you say about these cited irregularities that everyone is talking about? The idea that Sanupiev in certain constituencies, in Harare where you were, uh, seem to, to get or turn it around, get more votes than, than, than before. Do you agree or do you think this is just nonsense? Well, this will be the difficulty uh, because if, if, if everything that uh, has been said is, 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 is accurate, this would then suggest that uh, the ZANU-PF electoral uh, election machinery certainly did uh, the alleged shenanigans behind the scenes far away from mm. uh, observers or certainly from, from the media, from the general public. I mean, but if it's anything to, to go by well, in, in terms of people that we spoke to on the ground uh, in the area that we were, that's a ZANU-PF stronghold. But interestingly enough, one of the candidates uh, that was standing uh, for, for election there in the parliamentary lost uh, and uh, the results went against him and went to an MDC uh, uh, um, uh, candidate. So certainly that, that would suggest that uh, the electoral process was happening, but um, it's, it's very difficult to say conclusively. So Susan, do, you've covered many Zimbabwean elections. Do, do you agree with uh, Tommy's uh, view on this? Certainly I do. Uh, I think this was one of the probably easiest election I've covered uh, in terms of just uh, being able to access almost any part uh, of this country that I wanted to. I remember previously, the last election in 2008, I couldn't easily go into one of the townships in Arare because I was just so worried about my own safety because of uh, outbreak of, uh, of violence. So mm. this was very easy and even accessing government officials, accessing opposition officials. I mean, I've never spoken to some of the people that I've spoke to some of the ministers I was able to get a hold of mm. this time around. So it was a much, much easier election to, to cover, certainly, compared to previous ones. And, and, and finally, Ben said, wh wh what do you say about the eventual outcome? What does this mean for Zimbabwe? But more importantly, what is the mood of the people that you engaged with uh, during your coverage? Look, certainly in Bulawayo and in Arare, uh, most of the people I spoke to were quite disappointed at this result. Um, you know, but those are largely MDC strongholds. What it means for the future of Zimbabwe, difficult to say. I think that if uh, President Robert Mugabe brings in some of the uh, very um, strict indigenization policies that he's talking about, the economy could slip backwards. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if, if, he, if he tones it down a bit, then we could see uh, continued progress there. But I think the MDC has got to 
ask itself some very serious questions. Did we do enough in the last five years yeah. uh, while in government to push for security sector reform, to push for reform of the ZEC uh, and, uh, and, and other electoral laws? Did we have the right leader going into this? Did we work on the ground hard enough? I don't think this result can be explained away just by vote rigging. Yeah. I think ZANU PF worked harder over the last few years at trying to get the sort of result that we saw. And I think personally, it was a combination of a little bit of skullduggery, as we say, mm -hmm. and some really hard work from ZANU PF and the MDC, I think, up until the last few weeks, perhaps resting on its laurels a bit. Mm -hmm. What? That was uh, The View from the Press. Join us after the break as we discuss the irregularities and controversies of Zimbabwe's 2013 election, only on Africa 360. Mugabe Robert Gabriel of ZANU-PF party is therefore declared duly elected president of the Republic of Zimbabwe. Welcome back to Africa 360. That was the Zimbabwean Electoral Commission declaring Robert Mugabe the winner of uh, the presidential election without contestation. However, opposition parties and NGOs begged to differ. Observer groups, uh, the Zimbabwean Election Support Network had 7,000 local observers on the ground and kept a close eye on the results as they trickled in. This is what they had to say. There are issues which need to be answered by the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission. What we're doing is we're pointing out those issues as areas which are of concern and we need to wait to hear from the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission what the, their response is to those issues. So to help us break down what exactly those allegations of irregularities mean for the outcome of the 2013 Zimbabwean elections, I'm now joined by Trevor Maisire, a senior analyst from the International Crisis Group, and uh, Tabani Nyoni from uh, the Zimbabwe Crisis Coalition. Both monitored the polls closely from Zimbabwe. Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Let me start with you, Tabani. This talk of irregularities, is it just a case of uh, sour grapes after a loss, or is there some substance into these allegations? Thank you very much. There is a lot of substance. Talk to Zimbabwe Electoral Commission itself. It will admit that uh, the special vote that was done two weeks before the election had a lot of chaos and confusion. People didn't vote. We were supposed to vote 86,000 people. Only above 20, 25,000 voted. They will also tell you that they had to make an agent application to the Constitutional Court mm -hmm. to allow the people that, that were supposed to be voting on the special vote to then vote in, in the general uh, election of the 31st. Those are some of the indications. They will also admit that the voter's role was only available a day before voting which is something of a nightmare. How do you have the voters' roll on the day before the election when voters were supposed to inspect and update the voters' roll but time well before but the, but the date? Th th very well, Tabani, but let me bring Trevor in here. I, I, it does sound that there they, they could be some instances of irregularities in many elections. We see some of these logistical <coughs> difficulties. What is so outstanding about what Tabani is telling us to really uh, amount to the opposition in the main, uh, Morgan Twangirai saying that this is null and void. Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, for me, the reference is not only what uh, the MDC uh, Changirai is saying, but it is also uh, some of the reports uh, from uh, the uh, observer groups. Uh, in this instance, refer to the Africa Union uh, Observer Group. Uh, as you know, they have re uh, released a preliminary report. Uh, and in that preliminary report, I think of all observer groups, they are the most comprehensive in terms of listing some of the allegations, uh, ranging from what uh, Tabani has highlighted to issues of assisted voting, uh, to issues of uh, the lack of uh, the, the voters' role, not just the voters' role, but an but electronic it, copy of but the but voters' role. It's, it's funny that you are saying this, because at the very same time, regional bodies, here I'm referring to the African Union, proper Olusigano Basanjo who was leading that that group there and indeed the Southern African Development Community Group uh, led by um, a foreign minister member from Tanzania in essence all agreed that it in the main it was it was fair it was peaceful why, why would you guys now 
go against the region and their pronouncement on these elections? I, I don't think it's, it's about going against the region. Uh, I think there are two issues, Chris, that we need to, to, to realize here. There is what is called an outcome of an election, and then there is uh, the process of uh, getting to that outcome. I think if you look at what uh, Olusegan Obasanjo has said and others, uh, they have said we accept the outcome, but they have questioned the, the, the process. But also, if you look at African institutions, African institutions do not work by principles, they work by precedents. But, but so that's, when, that's, when, that's, that's, that's a damning yeah. thing to say, that mm. on the one hand, you, you are saying that they, 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 they don't operate on the basis of the actual substance of observations, but other political expedient decisions? Chris, let me come in there and assist my colleague. Yes, they work on the basis other than principle. There is such principles and guidelines guiding the conduct of free, credible, and fair elections. States clearly the kind of framework that you use to declare an, an election free, credible, and fair, and as constituting the will of people in that electoral process. It clearly states how and when a, a voter's role is supposed to be availed. It clearly states that there should be adequate time, preparation time, for people to actually register to vote. It clearly states, but in this Zimbabwean context also, there was an additional framework that was put in place by SADC in its mediation called the Roadmap to Elections. That roadmap was not followed. Check, three weeks before the election, the Maputo summit asked the Zimbabwean government to go back to court and request an extension so that the, f the specific reforms are put in place to make the environment conducive. Fine, so, so we've talked about some of these issues. What, what specifically, when you look at the, the numbers coming in here, uh, really, you know, are, are at variance because in the presidential poll, President Robert Mugabe Zanu PF, uh, in the parliamentary poll, President Robert Mugabe uh, Zanu PF coming away with 75% of that vote. Quite surprising. I think, as much as we focus uh, on the irregularity of the election, there's also issues of what the MDC parties did not do to mm. prepare for this particular election. I spoke to uh, one Zanu PF candidate who told me that from 2009, he has been in his constituency every uh, one weekend every month, and he only met the MDC candidate three months ago uh, b before an election. So, 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 so therefore, Tavani, mm -hmm. there, there must be something to be said about the ineptitude in which the MDC possibly engaged in this election as a narrative to help us understand why the outcome was so overwhelmingly in favor of ZANU PF. Let's discount for now th these irregularities that you have cited. Obviously, it's uh, interesting. I come into this debate from a position of suspicion. Um, I, I do understand MDCT got into government like ZANU-PF. They did things that ZANU-PF have been doing it, to some extent. MDCT came into government, they relaxed, they thought this was the time they would be finishing off ZANU-PF. There was no intelligence clearly from the party in terms of understanding they could have picked this up and the extent. What we know is that they kept on suspecting and raising this in rallies, but saying with huge numbers, we can deal with this. Clearly, MTCT did not have a think-tanking role in terms of really saying, how do we engage with this process? Well, that was uh, Trevor Maisiri and uh, Tabani Nyoni. Gentlemen, you have our thanks. It is indeed a crisis of regional proportions. Stay with us as we turn the questions to the politicians. We'll see you after the break only on Africa 360. The last time we spoke to you is that you expected a resounding victory for the movement for democratic change. It didn't really happen that way, did it? No, it didn't because it was stolen. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is Africa 360. This week, we look at the aftermath of Zimbabwe's recent general elections and ask what the result means for this country and the region as a whole. Well, joining me here in our Johannesburg studios is Kennedy Mandaza uh, from the victorious ZANU-PF uh, party. He's spokesperson here in South Africa. And in Cape Town, we're joined by uh, Kumbirai Muchemwa, who is spokesperson for the opposition party, the Movement for Democratic Change. That's uh, Morgan Swangirai's uh, faction. Let me start with uh, you, uh, Kumbirai, in Cape Town. You know, w w one of the key things that you said the last time we spoke to you is that you expected a resounding victory 
for the movement for democratic change. It didn't really happen that way, did it? No, it didn't because it was stolen. On what basis do you make those claims? I think a lot has been said about the voter registration process, the disenfranchisement of people who were not able to vote, who were not able to register firstly. Uh, at the same time, people were not able to check whether their names were on the voter's roll. This was confirmed on, an, on, a, on election day when uh, one of, the, one of an independ independent organization estimates that 82%, this is 82%, Chris, of people who turned up at polling stations found their names not on voters' rolls. What, what do you have to say uh, about this, Kennedy? You know, he's alleging that the victory of your party, ZANU-PF, is one that is null and void. It was stolen. These are allegations that we have heard since the time of the campaign that the election was going to be uh, to be rigged and after the, the before the finalization of the counting of the of the of the ballots we also had claims that the election had already been stolen before we had the election the, on the election day it was asked by many people that if there are any allegations that are coming up which have to do with the rigging of the election uh, of the election could the evidence be brought forward so that the issues that were being uh, referred to could be looked into and possibly addressed before we go into the actual election day. That's an, an, an interesting perspective uh, there, Kumbirai, particularly when you consider the fact that questions are now being asked whether indeed the MDC were ready from uh, this particularly well-organized election on the part of ZANU-PF. Don't you think that there is some blame to accord to the MDC in not being as prepared as they should have been for these polls? You know, it is often said that uh, true peace, true peace is, not, is not the absence of violence. It is the presence of justice. So when you go into an election and there is no justice, for example, the, the, chief, elec the chief election agent of our party, uh, Morgan Komichi, was in prison. He's still in prison. People were being, people were be, were being threatened in, in all sorts of manners in the rural areas to vote for, for a certain candidate. There is, because of the lack of this public statement by the generals, there is still the harvest of fear. You know, people still think uh, uh, ZANU-PF, given the history of 2008, will do anything and everything. And the post-election environment has proved that. Well, so the, the, in, the environment should have been cleansed of this fear, so which the, the, did not happen the, again. There the, the should have been a, a more leveler uh, playing field, and that is what is being alleged here by your colleague from the, the Movement for Democratic Change. Certainly, um, it's also been put forward that SADC was very keen to postpone these elections to ensure that some of these irregularities or outstanding issues related to the global political agreement were resolved before this poll. What do you have to say about that? It is true, yes, that uh, Sadak was, um, in fact, Sadak did not say you sh the election should be postponed. It advised those who attended, the leadership in the MDC, the leadership in ZANU-PF, the leadership that was in government during that time, that when you go back, could you please, through the Minister of Justice and the other people who that way in, uh, in negotiating, could you please come up with a document which you should take back to the Constitutional Court so that the Constitutional Court can look at the merits and demerits of postponing and the election and for and two and weeks. And, so and so Patrick and, um, did a document sorry, which he Kumbirai. essentially asked to lose. Sorry, Kumbirai, let's just give uh, Kennedy a chance to, to, to it was elaborate his position. Justice Minister Patrick Chinamasa who was tasked with the, with the mandate to go out and present that document, which he did. So, so then, uh, Kumbirai, in, in, in Cape Town, the question then arises is that do, do you believe that an effective, judiciable, fair and balanced uh, ruling could have been found from the courts in Harare uh, on the case that was presented by Patrick Chinamasa as instructed by Sadak? Well, I, I don't believe so. Um, and wh wh why is that? that wh why is that? Sorry, I apologize. Uh, Patrick Chinamasa is actually a minister of injustice in Zimbabwe. When he takes a, a, a case to court, an appeal to court, in which he essentially asks the court to rule in, in, against him, there can't be any justice there. When you look at the constitutional court itself, and the, and, and the, you know, the, 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 the justices who sit on those benches should be respectable. 
but you can't respect them on the basis of the of the judicial activism that they've, they've that they've engaged in. It doesn't it doesn't it, it doesn't uh, you know it doesn't give any confidence in the judicial process, in what Chinamasa using what, what his office was supposed to do, but he turned and, and and did something totally different. Well, that brings us to the end of yet another edition of Africa 360. I'd like to thank our guests uh, from uh, the two uh, political parties uh, in Zimbabwe. Even though there is not necessarily the kind of certainty that would like emerging from this situation, we will continue engaging in a deep analysis and understanding of what these implications mean to the people of Zimbabwe. So. Please be sure to tell us what your thoughts are via uh, Facebook or tweet us at a360 underscore ENCA or email us on africa360 at enca.com. So until next time, when you look forward to bringing you Africa like you've never seen it before, do take care.